thank you so much for joining us today um spending your thursday morning with us uh, i hope everyone's brunch boxes have arrived um if they haven't they are coming they were they left us on monday so hopefully they have um, you can feel free to tuck in now if you've got it and you want it. You can save it for later or if you've already eaten it, that's also super cool. Um, so, yeah, hopefully they uh, and also actually this was the first time our lovely new branded boxes. So we'd love any feedback on uh, on the boxes because they did look absolutely amazing. So massive thank you to Erin and Chantel uh, for working super hard on getting those out. But um, I'm Becky. If you don't know me, I'm founder here at Reflect Digital and we're a digital marketing agency that are here to unleash your potential. What do we mean by that? I always believe that there's more we can do and it's trying to find those little dials that we can turn up that mean that we can do more and achieve better results. And today, hopefully we're going to do that in talking about digital PR. As an agency, we specialize in leveraging human behavior insights and we use those to optimize everything we do from content and digital PR through to paid media, through to CX changes on your website to, to make sure that you convert more people. So that's kind of who we are. Um, we want today to be interactive. So if you've got questions that you go as you're going through, Jo, our wonderful um, speaker today, has said that she doesn't mind if we've got any questions popping up. So if you've got questions, just pop them in the chat um, and I'll kind of decide whether it feels like a now question or if you've put it there, I might wait for the end if I feel like it's more of an end question. But don't forget them. Feel free to put them in. We also have a QA and a as part of today. So um, a slightly different format if you've been to one of ours before. But we've got a fantastic journalist joining us as well as Joe, our fantastic um, speaker today. Um, so at about 10.40, I think Kaylee's going to join us. Um, she's from Ideal Home. I'll do a proper intro when she comes. Um, but as Joe's talking, think about questions. Obviously, Joe has been on the journalist side as well do her intro in a minute so she, there's lots of things she'll be able to answer but also the fact that we've got someone that's currently on the other side receiving all the digital PR requests etc anything you want to ask um there's no silly questions so feel free to to be thinking and getting ready to share those so what are we talking about today we're talking about what you can do now to amplify your marketing reach with digital PR in 2024. Um, so a lot of what Joe's going to be talking about is helping you think about how you can prepare things to, and making sure that you're planned and organized. Um, I got a sneak preview yesterday and it's awesome. There's loads of great tips in there. There's also loads of little case studies so you can show actually seeing how in real life this has come together. Um, so let me tell you about Jo, Joelle. She is our head of content and digital PR here at Reflect Digital. Some of you will already know her. Some of you, this will be the first time you get to meet her. You're in for a treat. Um, so she was previously a journalist for 10 years. She worked with ITV News, both locally and nationally. She was as an output pro producer and she was assistant news editor at Channel 5 News as well. Um, she's also worked as a news reader for radio stations across the UK and online publications. She now takes all of that media experience and applies that to our clients' needs. So working on their PR and content strategies and campaigns. So she's very well-versed in what she's talking about today. So without further ado, I think I will hand over to Jo. Um, and as I say, pop any comments in. I'm going to go on mute and uh, I'll be back when we're ready in to introduce um, Kaylee a bit later on. Yeah. Enjoy, Jo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Becky. That was lovely. Um, so firstly then, I guess what we really want to... Um, Talk about some really what is digital PR first and foremost. I mean, for me, it's amazing. Um, I just love it. Anyone who knows me knows I love it. I love seeing clients get coverage in the press and show them off and get results. Um, but the overall idea of digital PR is to establish trustworthiness and expertise so your audiences will build a positive image of your brand online. Um, it's different to so-called traditional uh, PR in that it has the capability to reach far greater audience because it's online. Um, and it can also help support other marketing efforts, such as your SEO or paid media and gain further brand awareness. And even the founder of Microsoft thinks it's great. So if I was down to the last dollar of my marketing budget, I'd spend it on PR. So thank you so much, Bill Gates. I love him. <laughs> um, so again, what is digital PR? So if we really break it down, um, it's a tactic used to increase a brand's online presence. So essentially it helps drive brand awareness, drive traffic to a website, it drives links, which boost organic rankings, and it increases social following and engagement. And it's used to promote content, stories, brands, and products online, and used as a way of staying ahead of the curve and standing out above your competitors. 
And with the right strategy, you can gain really good quality coverage and links that land, that, that land you links that actually get clicked on. Um, and we see this so often sometimes when looking at our clients' competitors where they have a link, but it's not relevant or it's a spammy site and it's just not being engaged with. So digital PR is all about obtaining links which are there for a reason that are reputable. And that drives traffic to a piece of content on a website because ultimately that's what we want to do and drives shares and engagement to a brand and drives higher branded search. And also we really want to um, get those leads to direct sales, which we all want. So what are the benefits of digital PR then? Um, as mentioned, it helps to generate relevant links from credible sources, which will help support your backlink profile and your overall organic visibility, especially, especially if you're targeting particular product pages, for example, or your keywords. So if you're a sofa company or a tile company, for instance, um, and you've been featured in relevant publications to your brand, such as House Beautiful or Country Living or Indie Best, um, then this is what is going to help. And the benefits are also that it improves search ranking scores and your website's domain authority. So if your brand is being seen in a variety of publications or on social media, then Google will see that you are a trustworthy source. And trust is the word I'll be using a lot this morning. <laughs> Um, so it also creates links that are earned for and not paid, which helps build that trust with your target audience. So when a journalist includes your brand or quotes in an article, it legitimizes your business for customers and potential customers. Um, rather than it being an advertorial or a sponsored article, which can often appear too salesy and unnatural and can put people off from reading. I know sometimes I am. Um, so our media allows you to reach a wider audience through word of mouth and social shares. And those links are produced as a result of having outreachable content that is relevant, engaging, useful, resourceful, or different, and mainly something, and this is really important, that's new and not that's not been seen before. And new is the key here. And it's certainly what some of us may know this already if you are in PR, but when trying to get press coverage, you have to bring something new, which hasn't been seen before or spoken about before. And that journalist is going to pick up and be like, oh my God, this is amazing. I want to cover this. And it's also about having good or genuine products and being a reputable and trusted brand too. But with these links, it's not just about the amount you have, although this is absolutely great. It's also about the quality of them too. So there's no point having a ton of links pointed to your website that are from spammy, unrelevant sites, as this will really devalue your website and Google just won't like it either. Um, so looking ahead to 2024, it's really important you think about this and also think, is it worth a link on this site? If it's not relevant to you or your target audience, just because it's in the mirror or the telegraph, which are amazing, um, is that really your target audience? Is that who you want to be reaching out to? But with the right strategy, you can achieve this and achieve both. And links which are relevant to your site and trustworthy can have a huge impact on your organic rankings. So as mentioned before, Google sees these links as a signal of trust and authority on a topic. And the more links from your authoritative sites talking about that topic, linking to you, the more Google will trust you. So if you are a clothing company, there's no point in being linked on Autotrader, for example, which although trustworthy in itself, it's not going to be valuable to you and Google will know that too. So what does digital PR look like as we head into the new year? Um, so it's it never sits still. It's just like the news. It's always evolving. Um, what was once popular, like infographics, which are still fine to use, they're now being replaced with or used alongside surveys. Um, we've also got TikTok trends and search trends. They're also becoming popular. So it's determined by people or audiences or really your customers and your client base. Um, and you can see this with AI making the headlines in the last year and the number of people coming up with digital PR campaigns with it. So one that stands out to me was during the Women's World Cup earlier this year, where a French ad went viral for using AI to promote women's football. And the ad features clips showing male players, but that later revealed that the clips were actually from women's games. Um, and it was a success as it was different, it was new, it was a talking point for online publications, but also for radio and TV and social media. So it really, really generated a buzz. But there's more and more comp competition to be seen in the right places at the right time, which is why it's so important to stay ahead of that curve. Um, and we're looking ahead to the new year in order to get noticed. This might sound obvious to some again, but it's to nail those key techniques, which I'll go into next. So these are planning and implementing the right strategy to help keep you on track. So looking at your audience insights and planning around them. 
creating content that really resonates with those audiences too, which is so key and building those quality relationships, which I'll go into all of them um, shortly. So strategic planning then, how on earth do you do it? Like there's so much noise everywhere. You may think, how, how am I gonna stand out from the crowd? But it's all about implementing a good strategy. So that means developing content that has a unique hook or an angle that journalists will be interested in. As I said before, it's like standing out. You're, you're, you're fighting against other PRs and other marketers trying to get, um, trying to be seen. So you might have heard this being thrown around a lot, but unless you are trained in PR or journalist, it might be tricky and you think, well, this is news, but for some it may not be, but you can do it still. So the content could be expert comment, a survey or data or interactive con content, which publications and audiences relevant to your brand will be interested in. So I explain this later too. So when talking about content, but this is what journalists look for at the moment more than ever, um, especially in the light of cost of living, how people are feeling about money. People want to read how to pieces or tips and advice ultimately to help them. So how can you create the best looking bathroom on a budget, for instance, and using these key colors and bring in a, a color expert or a psychologist to really understand what people are looking for and how this can help them. So why is strategy so vital? Well, it helps keep you on track to meet your KPIs and your goals and get those results too. And it helps you maintain and reach new audiences. So for example here, this featured in panel on our client's website is a sign to the audience and potential clients that the brand is trustworthy because it's seen in relevant and authoritative publications like the likes of Stylist, Telegraph, The Metro, which can help increase conversions too. They're seeing you as an authority. They're seeing, for instance, Complete Pilates are in women's health. This is key. This is a key audience for them. Um, as well as Life Science and Marie Claire, that's authoritative. That's really authoritative um, publications they're being seen in here. And that also plays into Google's EEAT standards um, in that it shows your experience, your expertise, your authoritiveness and your trustworthiness. So it's clear that this is becoming really important for ranking at the moment, especially as AI, which I'll talk about later as well, um, AI content that floods the internet. So you've really got to, you know, just really embrace those. So be experienced, have the expertise, authoritiveness as well, and trustworthiness. So what does a digital PR strategy look like and what does it involve? So it's about having those clear goals and objectives. So based on data insights, which again, I'll talk about shortly, it's important you set those SMART goals, which we all know about, and those should align with your overall business objectives and indicate what you want to achieve through your PR efforts. Yes, you want to drive brand awareness and be seen where your competition is, but how can this be measured? Do you want more traffic? Do you want more social shares, engagement, more links that will help you with your search strategy? Um, and are those links you've got driving branded search? So helping with you with your key search terms you want to be targeting or key products. If so, then your PR campaign should focus on that and you should look to implement a strategy to reach those audiences. If it's sales, do you have an action plan in place to drive people to purchasing or inquiring and finding out more? So if you're in an e-commerce brand, you probably want to be including that always on strategy in 2024. So producing content relevant to your brand and being reactive, therefore increasing the traffic and the links and the engagement. But also looking at key dates relevant to your brand and looking to be featured in gift guides, um, art listicles, product reviews throughout the year when timely, which will also ultimately be helpful for your sales and your sales goals. And it also involves being data driven to help you maintain and reach new audiences too. So that's gathering data from various sources before you start any strategy, such as your website's analytics, your social media metrics, your market research, customer feedback, and maybe your existing PR campaigns that you've done before on that performance data that you have there. And then you analyze it to identify trends, patterns, insights by consumers to create content that resonates with media publications that you want to target in order to reach your target audience. And you can do this using tools such as the ones we use here. And um, so that's Majestic and Buzzstream, but you can also use Google News to look at backlinks and coverage to help give an understanding of a brand's online presence, look at where they're getting links from and what type of content, perhaps you can replicate it, make it better even, and then formulate a strategy around that. 
And it's important to be audience led and have a clear understanding of your audience. So by this, I mean their demographics, their behaviors, their preferences and pain points. And this helps tailor your PR campaigns to specific audiences for better engagement. Again, you can do this by using tools such as Google Trends and search volume trends or your own website's analytics to identify what's popular and measure how engaged people are. And if they are engaged with it, they obviously, they're obviously keen for this type of content and that's what you should be doing. So as an example here, this is one of our clients, Hope's Grove Nurseries, um, who are online hedge and plant specialists. And we found out through website data and email marketing efforts that their customers like knowledge-based content. So in the top left, you can see that a higher percentage of their audience, they're female, they're in their forties, and they have interest in, as expected, um, home and gardens and landscape design, which helps us then to formulate our content strategy and target relevant publications with that readership. So by appearing in the likes of Country Living, the Daily Mail, Daily Express, um, alongside Monty Don, he's a, a famous gardener, so that's fantastic to feature alongside him too, an ideal home. Uh, we can resonate with their audiences while also gaining those all important links to help with SEO and search rankings and brand and keyword mentions. So now once you have all of your insights, um, it's then creating that content calendar, which is the next step. And if you get this right, then this will help keep you on track. Essentially, what we've got here is it's a centralized document that you can always refer back to to lock in those key timely dates that are relevant to you and the content you want to be outreaching and discussing based on your audience research and your goals and your KPIs. So it should also include any big campaigns you'll be working on throughout the year so you can plan accordingly. And remember, you don't have to do this alone. Speak to other members in your company from sales to marketing. Where do they see spikes in sales or has someone suddenly got popular? Look at why. Um, speak to those on the ground too. Is there a customer, a client, a service user you can use as a case study to give to a journalist that will tie in nicely with a particular key date? But also, can you provide tips or expert comments alongside this? So you're given a variety of journalists, different options, but ultimately the core theme is there. So the date is just the hook. Try to be human about it. Um, you can, so how can you humanize it? So this month is World Cancer Month, um, as some of you may know. And for our client, Complete Pilates, who are, um, or they provide physio for cancer patients. And we want to hear from clients to use as a case study to talk about how, the, how they've turned their life around by being more active. And then we tie Pilates into that and top tips for how, or uh, for those who want to exercise gently if they're going through treatment. And then we're offering a journalist so much more than just the tips or just the case study. We're giving them everything and it ties on those emotions too. Um, but things come and go in the news and what you think might work ahead of time may not when it comes to outreach. Um, for instance, a news story may break and your pitch may just get lost among all the noise. If so, then just wait, hold fire until there is a better time to release it. Maybe go back to your content calendar, look at what um, or when it might be best to re-release it. Or is there another content piece you could release instead um, that may be better suited or perhaps we, we, you know, we'll put this to the following week and we'll just shift things along a bit. Just don't give up. That content is still there um, and there may be a better time to, to outreach it. And then you can secure those results as well. So looking into the new year, what is coming up? So for instance, New Year's fitness trends, wellness trends, travel, fashion, interior trends, customer buying habits, or HR and security trends, for example. You could look in at Blue Monday, for example, how can you add cheer at this time of year or advice on lifestyle changes or career goals, for instance, and that's just January. So if you're an e-commerce brand, then when you head into the new year, you can, you can be looking at key dates relevant to your brand and how you can get featured in gift guides throughout the year. So Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, Easter, all sorts of things throughout the year. Look at journalists who cover them, what content they need. Do you have good pictures? Do you have really good images and all the key facts and pricing? But remember, it's not just about the products. You should have that always on strategy too. So producing content relevant to your brand and being seen as part of a conversation that's relevant to you to drive that brand awareness as well. So we've looked at why a strategy is so vital and how to pull one together, but now it's about creating that content and content that connects with audiences and journalists and the type of content which will get you noticed next year. Journalists will be continuing to look for so-called audience-centric stories. So what we, what we mean by this is we need to create content which understands their audience's needs, demands, desires, and expectations. 
to build campaigns that are most relevant and appealing to them. Now, this can be done in a way such as expert comment, as I've been mentioning a, long, uh, a lot, <laughs> like top tips and how to's, which are really popular at present and don't look to be disappearing anytime soon. No matter what industry as well, from lifestyle to B2B, most publications are looking for expert commentary. I remember you are the expert, and if you're not, get someone in who you can use as part of your PR plan. If you can supply a journalist with these, that are also timely and relevant, then you are a valuable asset to them. For example, we have an expert at a vet at a pet insurance company. We've got an expert gardener at our client Hope's Grove Nurseries and, Pilates, and a Pilates and physio expert at our client Complete Pilates, who are always on hand to give expert advice. Morris at Hope's Grove regularly provides commentary to Idle Home, among others. Not only are the links great, but it's also great for brand awareness too. And data storytelling will also continue to be prominent in 2024, be it producing your own surveys or your own customer data, or even peg it on a news study that's been released or using data that already exists in the public that you can craft your own stories to. So for one of our travel brands we work with, we recently trawled through a lot of data to search, so from search data, TripAdvisor data, Wi-Fi connection data, reviews, and many more to give us an index of the top 25 off the grid beaches for 2024. We use this data to create maps and graphics to pull together on a blog and a press release to send out at a time when people are looking to book their holidays for next year. We also found that the search term for off the grid holiday terms had grown enormously over the last year and the last three months. So it all fed really nicely into a nice data and visual piece, which talk about visuals, which I say is something we also need to focus on um, is good quality pictures and images. If you have good images and pictures, a journalist will love you and you'll be their best friend too. <laughs> so data is powerful and it's a great way to stand out from competitors. I just put a little example here. So for our client, Every Poor Pet Insurance, we looked at the most recent database of pet names to help us reveal the most popular pet names in 2023, with members of the royal family, leading actresses and music legends taking the top spot. So we pulled all this data together to give us many top lines that we knew would resonate with those journalists who write about celebrities, but also the royal family too. It also plays into Every Poor's tone of voice, showing they are fun and that they want to stand out from the crowd which this certainly does. <laughs> um, the results are great. So we landed coverage in the Daily Mail who picked up the names Baguette and Banana Donut to draw people in. Interesting. Uh, the Metro who picked up on that same theme too. And then we had Hello. So we went on the angle of the royal names here. We knew that this particular journalist writes about celebrities. She writes about royals and we knew this would be a great fit for them and their audiences too. Um, identifying trends, this is also key as we look ahead to 2024, you can start to look at what you think will be trending in the new year, perhaps look at your own data again, what are you seeing people buy more of compared to this time last year, again, asking people in sales, asking people in marketing, where are you spotting these signs and can you give me this data please because I really want to draw on this. Um, we ask our clients to send us top trends for the new year and reach out well in advance to some of our key contacts that we know will be interested in, in this content. Trends are not disappearing either. There are journalists who just specialise in trending stories. Um, in this case, we jumped on a TikTok trend um, where people were dyeing their dog's fur to make them look like animals. And then we use expert comment from our vet at um, every pore about the dangers of doing so. Um, so we pitched a journalist and it went global. We secured 43 pieces of coverage in the likes of The Sun, The Mirror, The New York Times, um, with 30 links and a combined total audience of 843 million. So you could start looking at what is trending now in your niche. What are people talking about and jump on them? You have to be quick though. They have to be viral as well. So you have to have over a million views and shares for a journalist to be really engaged and to, to claim it as a viral view as well. And um, so start looking now and, and really think about that. And if perhaps you don't know about TikTok, but you have someone in your team that does ask them as well. And here we knew that the sequel to Bridgerton was soon to be released, um, the hugely popular Netflix series. Therefore, we looked at online search data to reveal the popularity of Purple Wisteria, which had increased by 258% since the release of the trailer. And the search term topiary shrubs had also increased significantly, which tied into Hope's Grove, Hope's Grove Nurseries as well. We then can create expert tips on how to prune wisteria and look at after it and what would be useful to consumers. 
And this is picked up by various publications as well, such as, again, I do home, and just shows jumping on a trend has a great impact. And then ahead of the new year, we started putting together content ready for journalists for our client, again, Hopes Grove. So this ranged from trends pieces, winter gardening tips, a plant calendar that not only would sit on their blog, but be used as outreach too. So come early December, we jumped ahead of the curve and their competition, knowing journalists will not only be looking for Christmas content, and they get a lot of it, believe me, um, they'll be looking for new year pieces too, which can be a piece of evergreen content that readers can keep coming back to. And again, the results are great, securing coverage in relevant, highly authoritative publications, which linked back to the Hopes Grave Nurseries website. So the content calendar was published in Country Living at the start of the year. So Hopes Grove were then seen as the authority in the space over and above their competitors and seen in front of relevant audiences around the UK. You can also see here on Ideal Home, we've just had one released. So the winter flowers to plant now if you want colourful blooms for Christmas. So you can see they're already thinking about Christmas. So they are thinking about New Year now too. Um, and AI, this is also a big consideration as we look ahead to 2024. We all know that AI has been a big thing this year, and I'm sure it will continue um, next year and beyond too. And while it's great for us in PR at times to come up with PR ideas and brainstorms, it's important to emphasize and will not take away the human element. It won't build relationships with journalists. It doesn't have that niche expertise like you do, those industry skills or emotional intelligence that a brand does and that makes you stand out to a journalist. But what it can do is to help you create interesting campaigns. Um, here we have just used ChatGPT to come up with a synopsis of a film for Halloween based on plant names, which just adds a creative idea to our campaign strategy for Hopes Grove. And it's also new and different and it stands out. So for this prompt in ChatGPT, we just included film idea using the Devil's Claw or Venus Flytrap. And it came back with some really detailed film synopsis, which are really fun. It's just a really fun piece. And this is going to be released next week for Hopes Grove ahead of Halloween. So it's quite exciting. <laughs> um, and then we've got building relationships. So yes, you have to know the content that we've mentioned above, but it's also about building and maintaining those relationships too. Knowing what makes them tick and what doesn't make them tick. Knowing what topics they cover, what themes they cover and being human in your approach. You can use journalist databases or media lists to look for the journalists who cover topics relevant to your brand, but also just look at Google News. Look for reporters who have written about your industry or your competitors. Follow and engage with journalists on social media platforms like X, which was formerly Twitter. Um, share their articles, comment on their posts and build that rapport. I often use Instagram where I connect with some of my contacts too. Um, I definitely do use X still. It's not going away. Threads hasn't taken over. Um, but I do use Instagram where I connect with some of my, contact, my contacts, particularly in lifestyle, because there seems to be a lot on there. Um, and then they share their experience with, experiences with brands on social media too. So it's just a really good way of connecting with journalists. Find out where those journalists are. Some may be on X, some may be on LinkedIn, some may be on Instagram. If you find where they are and where they're communicating most, that's where you're going to be able to speak to them the most. Word of warning, don't just communicate with them via social media. Do, do spend time emailing them as well. Otherwise, they just get bombarded. Um, and building a social media presence can help you establish a really strong connection. And this is where behavioral science comes into play. So look at the nudges you can do to help build those relationships, be it in your subject lines or drawing on the emotions of the story. Know what's going to press or trigger or stir emotions, not only for the journalists, but the audiences of the publications too. So this is an interesting model um, when we talk about being human. So first and foremost, you've got to create those memories first. So this is the content we create. It needs to be memorable and draw on those emotions. Build those relationships and make them feel like they have made the right decision to connect with you as a brand. Being quick and responding straight away is the ultimate superpower which journalists love. And then continue to do all of the above in order for them to keep coming back to you and your brand. Give them reasons to do so and that they'd be stupid to go anywhere else. Go to any other brand. They want to be coming back to you. And this is an example of jumping ahead of the curve. So looking at trends and building those relationships too. So being human in your approach with your subject lines, how can it help their readers? Here you've got the messenger effect. So it's coming from someone that they want to listen to and has authority. So here in this case, it's Helen, the director and physiotherapist at Complete Pilates. Then we've got the personalization using you in the subject lines. Humans are lazy. 
and the easier and journalists too believe me <laughs> and the easier you make it for them and take away the hard work for them and tell them what to do with the content you are winning if they've got to scroll down what you've sent them and your key takeaway is at the bottom they they would have clocked off ages ago you want to be giving it to them at the start um, sending a thank you email as well also helps build on that relationships. It's so vital to do, just simple, but it's really effective. And from what you can see here, um, off the back of that, we secured a heap of coverage and front page news in The Guardian um, with links to Complete Pilates YouTube site online on, their on, on the online um, piece, which saw users increase dramatically. And that's what Complete Pilates wanted. They wanted more people to go to their YouTube channel and engage with that, which they certainly did. And we also secured a series of coverage on Fit and Well too, which plays into the target audience of Complete Pilates. Fit and Well is one of the key um, publications for health and well-being, which is where Complete Pilates want to be. So thanks to one journalist that we approached with content way ahead of the new year, sending them a thank you for the coverage that they've already that um, they've already secured for us over that year previously, we ended up getting tons of results into the new year and beyond too. And because we sent it out ahead of Christmas, we also had them asking for comments at Christmas time too. So we had them in women's health. We had them as a lead expert and talking about well-being tips. So it wasn't just Pilates. It's about being well -be well-being. So the overall health, it doesn't have to be just about Pilates. Obviously, it's going to be relevant, <laughs> um, but it can be that overall story as well. So let's wrap up. So a strong strategy will help keep you on track in 2024. Craft content that resonates with audiences and journalists. Utilize that data and those trends too, and start building those relationships now ready for 2024. Um, and now I've got a QA. and I think she's here. Hopefully she's here. It's Kaylee Dre, who I've built up a lot of relationships <laughs> with recently, as you can see. Um, yeah. I don't know if she's joined just yet, joined. Jo, because I think she was coming in about five minutes. So um I can't see her in the participant okay, no list unless she's on as a different name, which sometimes happens on people's Zoom. Um, but let's see if you want to stop sharing your screen so we can see your face more. So that was amazing. Let's I've got questions for you. So while we wait for Kaylee, I can uh, I can ask you some questions and so can the audience. So now's the time if you've got any questions for Joe to start popping them in the chat. Um, or if you want to raise your hand, you can raise your hand on here. I'm sure you can. Yeah. Um, and if you want to chat, uh, then you're very welcome to join the chat. But um I guess the first thing that just came to mind, just because it's one of the last points that you finished with around gifts, like, is there a fine line when it comes to sending gifts? Do some people see that? Like, uh, yeah, is there is that something to be cautious around? Yeah, I would be cautious with it. I mean, obviously, I had built up a relationship before with those journalists. I'm constantly talking to them. So it's easier to give them a gift and just has a little thank you. And it wasn't anything extravagant. It was literally a little wellness package just to say thank you, just as you probably normally would with some of your clients. Um, that. it's more about that thank you just the thank you email is all you really needed and it I mean it gave them for for, for, for that particular reason it just gave them like oh thank you so much we feel important too and journalists do love them and some of them were freelance so they don't often get much recognition for being freelance they're on their own um they're sitting on their own they're not in big offices so actually to receive something like that was quite nice for them um but I would just do that with a bit of caution get to know them maybe first but definitely send those thank yous um Definitely. Yeah. It's the same across all areas of business that a thank you goes a very long way, doesn't it? So, uh, yeah, I think sometimes we can forget that, can't we? Um, and just thinking um, a lot of the examples we looked at and we talked about, which are super exciting. Of, uh, I could spend all day listening to the work that you and the team do because it is just amazing. But thinking on the kind of B2B side, because I know we've got some B2B brands here, PR, digital PR is still as much for B2B, isn't it? Because I think a few of those were maybe more e-com um, or B2C. But it's there's just as much of a place isn't there oh 100 definitely you can talk about your brand and um, you can talk more about growth perhaps there are still still um fun campaigns that you can do the light's just gone out in our room <laughs> um with b2b campaigns as well but definitely any thought leadership is the, is the biggest thing for b2b which you tend to do anyway but it's um it's just amplifying it that bit further and go and talk to those digital publications and ones perhaps you may not you may not think about but also the expert comments expert comments is still relevant um if you're in b2b publications as well they're still looking for that 
Definitely, definitely. And I think it's also like, um, I suppose to some of our B2B clients, the things that I try and get them to remember is you're still selling to humans. Yeah. Um, so all of the behavioral stuff still plays in and there's still an audience. So no, I love that. And um, we've had a question. Uh, oh, this person must have their name with their surname. Um, so Phil one. that <laughs> um, if you were to submit three pieces of content, what sort of uptake would you expect to get? It's hard to get noticed and get it out there. Tough um, question. <laughs> three pieces of content I mean you'll probably split that over a month if you were if you need if you wanted to get three pieces of content out and it, obviously it has to be timely as well you can't just expect to send out content and it not and it not be timely um and generally speaking if we it can vary you can get like a couple of pieces of coverage or you can get 30 pieces of coverage with one piece of content but I think the ultimate thing is is it timely is it new um, is it relevant and then a journalist will think yeah okay so you'll have that content but it's maybe be the pitch that you need to work on um, so get that hook in first be human in that approach so make it more um, about what's going on now and the reasons why this piece of content is going to help you um, so generally it, it can vary and it can just vary on what's going on in the news as well um, but yeah we'd say it's, it can be from 10 to 30 maybe more sometimes with pieces of content Definitely. And what is your follow up process? And a two part question. If you do send a story out, you've done your follow up process, but maybe it got buried by some other news or it just doesn't seem to have hit home. Can you try again? How do you try again? How many times can you try again? I don't know. That was a lot of questions, but you get where I'm going. So generally like, we'd send out and then perhaps if the day after that you send it out, so the day after the, yeah, so like we send it out on the Monday normally, we'd send out press releases or pictures, and then on the Wednesday we'd follow up. If it hasn't how much, like journalism, Kaylee will probably back me up on that. Once after the two tries, it's probably going to be, a, a, you know, more likely to be that they're just not interested. Um, but you know, you think, actually, no, I know this content is going to get great. And actually, that if you have um, HubSpot, which I use to monitor my opens and um, how many people are engaged with my emails, I know that sometimes they've read it so many times. And I know, well, actually, they keep going back to it. So there is something there. Um, look at maybe why they've gone back to it. So you could be like, OK, something's happened in the news. I can now tie this to um, or just ask them again, like, oh, you know, I noticed you perhaps, or not noticed because that might look like you're stalking, um, but it's more like go back to them and say, oh, um, I'm just getting in touch again, such and such has happened in the news, just thought this might be relevant to you. Um, journalists will just say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, like this is just, it's just been buried, I've had a really busy day um, or a busy week and I will get this published. Um, so don't ever give up. Um, I think there is a line if it's like, <laughs> just don't, what I'm, my one piece of advice is just don't keep hassling them. If you have had two follow-ups, kind of leave it, check on the engagement. And um, if they are going back to it, then yes, like maybe do another follow-up, but it, it can, it can um, become too much and th then you will be on their blacklist. If for instance, you had this really good campaign and you know that you, you think it's outreachable again, just tweet the top line again. Um, maybe you, the expert comments were at the bottom, bring them to the top and um, make that the, 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 the hook now. Um, and then it's so like, yeah, it's just the various ways you can do it, but I definitely would recommend just, just tweaking it, tweaking it to the, the time of the year, or if there's any other, uh, any other hook that you can use or, use or bring in an expert to. Amazing. What's, um, what's your piece of favorite piece of coverage you've ever got? Tough oh, question. It is a tough question. Um, a tricky one I mean I mean for me I'm very much in the, the wellness and fitness I love that kind of um area um so for me getting complete Pilates in in the Guardian and front page news which is where they wanted to be as well and also the Telegraph um massive feature there for them all about back pain and for me that really excites me um knowing that that's what they wanted that was their goals but I love the creative campaigns that we do as well. Um, particularly for every pool, we have a lot of um, TikTok trends that we we jump on, but also like like what we was in the deck really, just um, the strangest pet names, something really fun. Like really, it just it just makes my day as well. It's just really um, it's really engaging as well. Um, or yeah. our, I mean, we did do one with um, a, a trophy company a few years ago now. Um, with the world's uh, most expensive trophy and we actually recreated a trophy <laughs> um and replicated it as if it was going to be the world's most expensive trophy and we you know we measured it out got the diamonds 
like you know um how much diamonds would cost to put it up so we, we therefore was um the most expensive trophy but a replica of and we put it as like a product on their site um and then we outreached it and that went into talk sport and the sun um they actually got a lot of pr uh, broadcast press talking about funny enough um so that was a really fun one as well to do uh, yeah. Love that. That it just shows that there's no boundaries as well. Like you can just come up with a weird and wacky idea. And as long as because actually I remember when we did that campaign, we made it so that it actually if someone did want to buy it, like if you've got some, I don't know, super rich person that wanted to come and spend their millions on it, actually we knew how we we, we knew how to make it. It was actually it was a genuine product. We just yeah. hadn't made it because uh yeah, we didn't have that kind of money. But um now I've spotted Kaylee, you've joined us. Where is Kaylee? Do you want I don't know if you've got your camera on? Do you want to come say hi? Hiya. Hello, Kaylee. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Very good. So lovely for you to join us. Now, I mentioned you at the start, but I thought I'd wait to do your intro to when you joined. Um, so everyone, this is Kaylee. So Kaylee is content editor for Ideal Home. Um, she's got an outstanding career in, in the PR field. So let me tell you a little bit about Kaylee before we go into questions. So she's been a digital content creator and editor for just over a decade, having worked in-house at publications such as Closer, Cosmopolitan and Stylist. Um, she's also written extensively for the likes of the AV Club, Made for Mums, Refinery29 and the Irish Independent, among others. And her work frequently touches a chord with audiences, sparking conversations and driving a lot of traffic in the process. So currently she is Idle Homes content editor, editor, where she focuses her attention on creating excellent articles about garden, living rooms, bedrooms and or oh, can we mention it? Christmas. We're starting to see Christmas in all the shops now. So no doubt the content is coming. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Kaylee. So Joe's done a fantastic presentation just now around digital PR and thinking forward to 2024. We've just been quizzing Joe as well. So um, but also as I ask these questions, Joe, if you've got any thoughts to add in, it's kind of uh, all open. I've got questions, but as I said to the audience, if you've got questions, start popping them in the chat and I will definitely um, get them asked to Kaylee while she's here. So I guess one of the first questions that always comes to mind um, when we get to talk to a journalist is how do you prefer to be contacted? Like you're busy. I can imagine your inbox is full all day. Like how do you prefer for people to reach out to you if they've got a story to pitch? Generally, to be honest, I think most journalists will say, always email rather than rather than the phone because our phones tend to be ringing all day um we, we're always on our emails checking uh the best thing to have is a really good subject line so we we hone in on it straight away amazing potential and what about social media and if they come via twitter or x should i call it or instagram does that work for you uh it does sometimes sometimes people disappear into that weird inbox that you don't see for a couple of yeah the weeks and I always feel very bad because I'm like oh, I've missed your missed your message but I think if people tweet at you and then message you you're more likely to pick it up yeah that's a really good tip and what puts you off when when you receive a pitch is there anything that you're like oh no I can't even get to the bottom of this <laughs> um I guess some people don't really do their research I mean when I was at stylist my everyone's pet peeve there was if they called it the stylist rather than <laughs> stylist we'd always be like no we're not going to be the sumo um but I think just making sure you've you've worked out what people actually who the audience is for the magazine you're looking at because we've had I mean ideal home I've had lots of people send me beauty pitches recently and obviously we don't write about beauty so um no good for us so no, relevancy yeah. is important and also yeah getting your getting brand names right I can imagine that must be so annoying if that happens regularly yeah definitely <laughs> what um what are your thoughts on AI because everyone keeps talking about AI are you at ideal home are you doing anything to make sure that content is human written and not AI generated or what are your thoughts um, so at, um, at Ideal Home, we don't use any, any AI in-house to do writing. We, I think we prefer the personal touch. We have like techniques we use obviously to hit those Google algorithms ourselves. Um, but we find that everything feels much better in our, when we've got writers with their own tone of voice, they tend to speak more to our audience. So people sort of repeat, come back looking for their content in particular. Um, but I've done a lot of research into AI myself and I feel like people are probably going to have to use it more for research maybe or coming up with ideas and headlines I, I don't think you can kind of ignore its presence sadly <laughs> it's it's definitely there I feel like if you don't evolve with it then then you'll be left behind 
definitely that's uh that place to exactly what joe was saying earlier i think as well it is <laughs> using it for kind of creativity or um using it to try and yeah help maybe refine a subject line you might have some ideas and like what could be a really good subject line for this story and uh, and getting it to be a bit more creative maybe then uh sometimes if uh, our brains don't always tick as creatively as we want them to do there <laughs> um Thinking forward to 2024, like what would your tips be if people are trying to think about their 2024 strategy? When when are you looking for people to be reaching out to you about January? Is, is now too soon or what? Yeah. What kind of things would you be thinking about looking forward? Uh, to give you, like, we're, we're sort of like not looking at Christmas even until beginning of November. So that's where we are. I think when, with digital, you can be much more immediate and we tend to be driven a lot more by google we look at the most trend trending questions on google that drives a lot of our traffic so our deadlines seem to be a lot more immediate um i guess so keeping an eye i mean with gardening in particular if, if that's something that comes up like there's a lot of questions that will come up the same time every year um but we have noticed with how the seasons are shifting there's a lot more strange <laughs> um abnormalities so one of our best performing stories was about why people's green tomatoes aren't ripening um, so I guess focusing on like what maybe the weather's doing or what what may have changed people's normal routines and just keeping an eye on what those Google trends are each day. That's how we normally define our content strategy. It's a really good tip. It's so interesting, isn't it, working in this space? Because it is you, you have no idea what's coming sometimes, do you? You can plan, but it's uh, it's following those trends, isn't it? Mm. What um what's your favorite piece thinking of that kind of 10 10 year career you've had what's the favorite piece that you've been involved in and and what made it so I don't know so memorable and exciting oh wow um good question sorry <laughs> <laughs> when I was at when I was at Silas I launched a campaign called Under Her Eye which was to um widen the world of film critics and tv critics because it's such a male dominated space so I did a big nationwide campaign to find women from backgrounds that wouldn't necessarily have been offered that opportunity. And I mentored them for a year and we, we've we kept that under her eye section going. So I still actually work for Stylus on a freelance basis on their entertainment content. Um, and it's one of their top platforms really. Um, wow. So I'm very proud of that one. Yeah, that, that sounds amazing. And if you're working on something like that, so obviously that came from an internal um campaign an idea for example is there then opportunities for people in industry to then say oh, I've got a story to pitch to be a part of that or how does that kind of process work when it's something that you're kind of you're already championing that you want to talk about from a um, publication perspective yeah absolutely I mean if we once we've we've announced these things we are always really keen for people if they have like like a hook or if they have some really interesting studies or data studies drive a lot of content actually on every publication I've ever been on. So if you have a really interesting piece of research, even if it's quite small, um, that can create a story that feels exclusive. I think that's always the big thing. We don't really want to do the same that everyone else is, is doing. You know, sometimes uh, a gala bingo study will go everywhere. You'll see it in like the sun and the daily mail and every magazine will have it. Whereas if maybe someone has a bit more of a niche piece of research that they've done internally, that's always really helpful. Love that. And would you be so if if someone was offering something to you exclusively, would you be more interested in that than something that you do think might go to lots of other publications? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it depends if it if it was a really big story or a big name and it was going quite a few places, then yes. But it's always nice if you can think of a way to make it a little bit more exclusive. So if you have an expert that can add additional quotes that might tailor it to a piece or um imagery that people don't have access to or just something that makes it feel like theirs because obviously google penalizes if everyone's just churning out the same words that's a really good point um and obviously just thinking i think a lot of people think of the world of pr probably i don't know how many years we need to go back but there was a time where people were taking journalists out for lunch all the time and dinners and whining and dining and that was kind of how they made sure they had the relationship to to get the story where they wanted it it feels like it's not like that anymore is that is that true do you do you get wined and dined do you want to be wined and dined how does this work <laughs> i haven't been um, since lockdown we haven't really been wined and dined as much but i know um it just depends like cuz i'm remote based I tend to be working from home a lot more, but if people were willing to wind and dine me, I would obviously disappear into the city. Um, it's it's just nice sometimes to just build a rapport. Like when you, I, I work with Joanna quite a lot. Um, we talk a lot about different pieces. So you can build a rapport 
online as well is maybe just treating people like like humans I guess, rather than yeah. and I love that the fact that you guys have built a relationship so because I think that's I suppose the ideal is instead of being in a world whereby you're like right I finished my press release it's all perfect this is I'm just going to send it and you've never heard about it if you've heard about it beforehand and you've almost got some input of we're thinking of creating a story around this what do you think would it work for your audience etc is that a way that you like to work once you've got a relationship with someone so that you can kind of have that input almost into where the story's going before it's finalized and in your inbox ready to go yeah, absolutely. Like, there's a garden designer I work with who's launching her own range of raised beds, basically. And we've been in contact about that for a while since she came up with the idea and figuring out how we can weave it into a story. So, yeah, I think if you can work with a journalist from the beginning or from quite early stages so you can figure out what they need to make it work, then that that's always a good idea. Love that. Joe. have you got any questions for Kaylee? Um, I have quite a few. Um, so what will you be looking out for in 2024, do you think, then, Kaylee? So in terms of, you do lots of interior bits as well. Um, what 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 would, like, really grab your attention for next year, do you think? Um, well, so we, we've launched this platform on Ideal Home called Happy Home, which is all about linking, I guess, psychological studies to interiors and garden design. So I'm trying to think of an example. We did something on how to get your sleep routine back on track by making physical changes to your bedroom, basically, where we worked with a few sleep experts. But we also wove in some some stuff about just what a sleep routine is and what a good one looks like. So anything that makes it feel more, I guess, service based in that sense would be really lovely to have. Like, um, anything that sparks joy in people or I know lots of people get a lot of emotional well-being from being outdoors. So studies which specifically link things that people can do practical stuff around the house and garden would be wonderful Super. and like psychologists as well seem to be quite a big thing like color experts and that kind of thing and mm. bringing in those experts like I've said before in the deck that it was just to yeah bring in the experts if you, if you have them or you can get someone um that would then just like just help help them out yeah definitely and if you have like access time for like interview questions if it's even if it's just over email and they don't have time over the phone or in person that's always great too because we can bulk up a lot of our we have lots of content going on that we update throughout the year as well so we can just bulk up responses and use it across the board super um what else was i going to ask you <laughs> um uh... I can't think. So what what will you think of what will you be like looking for around Christmas time as well? Um, is there any particular uh, stories that you'll be thinking? Yeah, that's what I would want. Um, so Christmas time, I guess we do a lot on obviously Christmas decor, like how to how to do it. Um, we were looking at like hacks for how to make your treat. There was that TikTok hack going around where people were putting like four baubles on a pipeline and then hanging it on the tree rather than just hanging one directly. So <laughs> stuff like that, like just little hacks that can make people's homes look, look very nice we call um the ideal home audience are very sort of mrs hinch in lots of ways so they they like um that sort of style of decor and um i guess if you look at stacy solomon's big like outdoor halloween arch that she's got on her front door at the moment like we were trying to figure out a way to do something on that but christmas related bits and bobs just to make it a bit more interesting love that we've just had a quick question in from ellen around what makes a good email subject line you both might have some ideas on this well i know you will both have some ideas on this <laughs> i'll let you go first though um gaily i guess maybe the um the headline like a short version of a headline that you would you would click into if you saw it on on a story online so i use a tool called what is it called co schedule as a headline tool and it will you keep putting in different versions and it'll give you a score based on how clickable it thinks it is um and I use that to death I probably test out about 80 different headlines before I run a story so I would recommend using something like that just to make sure it feels really grabby because obviously that's the first thing people see that's really cool love a tool as well Joe. what are your tips on subject lines <laughs> for me I would always put I mean in my email subject lines it's definitely like what you are going to them with so expert comment um is it a tiktok trend so put that at the first at the first it, they know exactly what it is um and keep it short and sweet as well like don't make it too long and bring in that like what you want to get across straight away don't put it at the, the very end because it just probably won't get seen um yeah just to like engage with them at the very start and like jump out because as you as Kaylee said they are you're getting on a lot of emails and you want to be you want to be seen essentially yeah 
Hayley, if someone reaches out to you and it obviously hasn't resonated and maybe you haven't responded, if they, if, because sometimes that can be that just it hasn't resonated or sometimes it can be it was a busy news day or there was lots going on and it's got buried and missed. Do you recommend that if someone wants to try reaching out again, that do they almost try and make it a fresh approach as though it's not been something or is it a, did you see my email or is that annoying or what's the kind of, what do you find the best approach there to grab attention if they've missed you the first time? Um, I am, I'm, personally, I'm a natural people pleaser. So if someone said, did you miss my email the first time? I'd be horrified and I'd jump in. Um, and, but I would say probably for most people, I'd give it like a day or two and then maybe try it at a different time of day. Because if you ping people in the morning, that's normally when they've got news meetings and they're getting all their first, especially on a Monday, you get given your list of what you're working on. So your brain is just focused on that. Um, so I would recommend something a bit quieter, like maybe like just after lunch on a Tuesday or a Wednesday and then try them again oh interesting tips there I like that yeah it's tough isn't it and do you aim to respond to everybody I do try yeah I, every now and then I will let one slip through the net but I usually try and make sure I get back in touch with people unless it's one of those clear blanket emails that's gone to everyone without a name because then I don't feel so guilty yeah no with you on that with you on that no it's definitely we we you're a people pleaser and you like people to also take care and attention that you're a person as well so definitely that more personalized approach is very very much needed isn't it but um does anyone in the audience have any questions because we're very close to wrapping up but just if there's any final questions um i feel like i've learned loads i'm definitely going to be testing out that um that tool for headlines co-schedule that sounds amazing is that joe have you used that one before oh thank you for oh. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're all going to be on there this afternoon having a little play with our uh, headlines because uh yeah it's it's one of those things even if it's not for digital pr an email subject line is quite important to grab people's attention isn't it so uh yeah. Is there um, is there anything else on your mind that you think an audience that have just been hearing all about digital PR and prepping for next year that they should know or like your one top tip um, uh, for the audience, Kaylee? Um, don't, maybe just don't think too far ahead. Like I feel like especially with digital journalism, if there's the journalist you're approaching, I like, don't start hitting them with Valentine's Day when it's still Christmas because our brains just don't work like that. We're much more, I would say, the next three or four weeks max. So I would just focus on the immediate. I mean, as Joan knows, I normally message her like, I need it today. I <laughs> 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 love that. And I think that plays in so where everyone on the webinar, Joe's been talking about planning in advance. So that's your internal planning and making sure you're ready, but actually going to the journalist much closer to the time. But it means that you, because also we all know that sometimes it's that herding cats internally, if it's someone else's comment you're trying to get or their feedback, etc. So getting yourself organized and in order so that then you're ready to go to the journalist but in that window where they're going to be interested in that content so um i think that's brilliant brilliant advice um thank you so much for joining us kaylee i think we we owe you a wine and dine in london maybe <laughs> so let's uh, let's see if we can sort that out hopefully that's been super useful for everybody um Chantelle is going to pop into the chat in a second the link for feedback now we all know that if you think oh yeah I'll do that later you probably won't because we're all lovely but we're also really busy so we'd love it if you could just take a minute or two now to just jump on the feedback link and give us feedback we love running these but we also want to make sure they're useful to you as an audience so your feedback will help us shape our future brunch and learns um you'll get a follow-up from us later today um with links to the slides and um contact details and anything if you've got any further questions you know you can reach out to us but um just thank you all so much for giving up your tuesday or tuesday thursday so please it's thursday not tuesday we're nearly at the weekend um giving up your thursday morning to be with us today and for kaylee really appreciate your time and your insight into the world of a journalist and joe for all your hard work in putting together a fantastic presentation which i know everyone will have found useful um and will enjoy reading those slides back through um so thank you all so much and yes please hop on the feedback i'm going to put some lift music on now while you kind of stay finish your feedback and then enjoy the rest of your thursday but thank you everyone